Is there any reason not to use iterative deepening, assuming that you're in a uniform cost domain? So all actions cost the same, so we don't have to worry about the fact that depth and cost might not be the same. Uh, so assume we're in a domain like that. Is there a good reason not to use iterative deepening search? You're supposed to sit here. Your name is, is uh, uh, Nathan. Yeah. Nathan, so. Well, the textbook says at least 11 parameters are open, so I just want to know. Don't believe everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, so now we got into a big discussion about duplicates, and I even mentioned transposition tables, which weren't in my slides and stuff like that. So if you just do plain old iterative deepening, which is depth first search, uh, and then you increase the bound, and then you do another depth first search, depth bounded, and then you increase the depth bound, another depth first search. Uh, that will fail terribly in domains like your assignment unless you do some kind of duplicate checking. Standard depth first search doesn't keep a closed list, it doesn't keep a transposition table, it doesn't do diddly about duplicates. And let me tell you, if you're on a grid, well, I'm not supposed to write. If you're on a grid, uh, There are a lot of ways of getting here from here. How many ways? Hmm. It boggles my mind to think. You can go here, and then go here, and then go here, and go here. Or you could go here, and here, and here, and here. Or here, and here, and here, and here. Or here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And there, or there, and then up, and then there, and then down there. Or this way, that way, that way, that way. Oh, but then, oh, we're not doing duplicate checking? Oh, OK. Maybe I'm going to do simple cycle checking. OK, fine. So I won't be able to loop back, but I'll be able to do this twisty, turny kind of a path. Um, you can go over and back and down. Um, there are lots and lots of ways of getting to any one particular cell. Uh, and if you're not catching that, oh, wow, I've been in this cell before, uh, you're going to visit all of those. Um, in fact, there's actually an exponential number of ways to get to any particular cell. So uh, depth first search is exponentially bad in domains like grids. The, my favorite like toy example domain that's like let's be mean to depth first search is, uh, and I do, I, my students and I sit around and, and torture computers in this way. Um, I'm very much against torturing animals, but torturing computers is just fine because they don't yet have moral stature. Um, so you have a couple actions. Right? And just imagine a chain, a chain that's like n long of these states that are they're going together. So if you're checking duplicates, right, they're only n states. So your search is over in order n time. If you're not checking duplicates, like how many ways are there of getting here? Well, there are two. How many ways are there of getting here? Well, there are all the different ways of getting here. And then for each of those, there are two. So it's this times two. So it's two times two. Here, how many ways can I get here? Well, all the ways of getting here plus each of those we can add on a different one. So it's multiply that by two. So this is two to the first, two to the second, two to the third. There are two to the n different paths down the chain. So duplicate checking saves you an exponential amount of work. Um, so this is like very, very bad for, for plain old depth first search, this ugly chain graph, this mean old chain. Um, so uh, is Iterative deepening, like the answer to everything, um, not if you do the plain old, not duplicate checking approach. So, yeah. Um, this was a kind of a deep question. Uh, how do AI systems recognize mistakes? Right, so, so if at one point an action worked, and another time an action doesn't work, um, how do you assign the blame? So this sounds to me like it's a question that's dealing with stochastic actions. And we're not really talking about those yet. We're going to wait a few weeks. Um, although it's awesome you guys want to know about stochastic actions because they are important. Um, You could think of like keeping the average value of an action, right? And maybe sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, and you want to keep track of how 
good it is on, in general. Um, but then there's the question of, well, can you learn the context in which the action is good? Maybe there's some things like, uh, you know, shouting fire is a great thing to do if there's a fire, but if there isn't a fire, it's actually a really bad thing to do. So we should learn this contextual cue, like when I see fire, I can say fire, but otherwise I shouldn't. Um, so that's called a feature of the state that's important for just knowing the value of an action. And we'll talk all about this all at great length later, but those are the kinds of ideas that, that come up. Um, now, if we don't have the same cost for every action all the time, then iterative deepening with a depth bound is not optimal. It's not admissible. It's not going to find the optimal solution. Um, how can we fix that? How can we fix that? So we got, we got remember iterative deepening here. We, we're going we're gonna to do a little depth first search down to some bound, and then we increase the bound, and we do another depth first search, and another depth first search, and uh, oh, I'm lying to children. This is evil. So everyone always draws trees like this, but you notice that in tree, this kind of a tree, we're growing like roughly constant fact, uh, constant amount at every level, and of course real trees grow exponentially. So I just want you to realize that real trees look like that. They're just, it's like not as much fun to draw though. So nobody draws trees like that, but that's what they actually look like. So iterative deepening, you're increasing your depth bound, but what if different actions cost different amounts? So I've got some node here, and now this is costing 5.1, and then over here, like that's only costing 4.9. And if I'm doing my depth first search along and I hit the goal, and I'm like, oh, I'm done. But in fact, there's another better solution somewhere. So how do we fix this? Can we fix it with iterative deepening? Yeah, how do we make iterative deepening work on problems like this? Very simple fix. Look Sorry? The Say that again. Look all the options on the current node and take the cheapest one. Now remember, it's, depth for, it's we're doing depth first search, so we don't actually remember any of this stuff. We just revisit it. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep track on our previous iteration. What's the cheapest node that we generated but didn't actually expand? Like we generated it and we said, oh, that's over my bound. I can't recursively descend depth first into that child because he's too expensive. The G value is too high. My G, instead of having a depth bound, we're going to have a G bound. So I say, oh, no, the G value of that node is like 5.1 and my bound is 5, so I can't go there. Um, and then you hit some other node, and oh, the G value of that node is 5.01. That's greater than 5. I'm not going there. The next child, oh, that's 6. That's way bigger than 5. I'm not going there. And you keep track. And at the end of the iteration, you say, hmm, well, I expanded everything that was 5 or less, but I did see a node that had a G of 5.01, and I didn't expand it. So that'll be my new bound. You, you, you increment the bound by the minimum possible to the cheapest node that was generated but not expanded. And now when you go through, now if you see a 5.01, you can expand it. You can go down. And you're doing this extra little level of the onion, the 5.01 level. Um, now why is this really awful in general, Adam? It's a double generation that goes The question is how many nodes are there extra that you get with the 5.01 that you didn't already get with 5. If you doubled, if you doubled the iteration, if there are in fact twice as many nodes with 5.01 as there were with 5, then we're still good. And the overhead is bounded by the you know, little geometric construction I did last time. Um, but if there are like five new nodes at 5.01, like that's not helpful. That's too few. We did all that regeneration. We regenerated all the fives just to expand those five more 5.01s. And um, so we paid a lot to get those five nodes. So the overhead uh, now swamps iterative deepening. Um, so the conventional wisdom is that iterative deepening is really lousy on problems that have real value cost, where actions can cost different amounts. There are ways around that. Um, I don't know why we don't cover them in this class. I guess because we want to leave you some hungering for something else to do in CS uh, 931. 
which is a whole class on search that uh, you can take after this. But we'll talk and we can talk in that class about how do you how you can modify iterative deepening. But basic iterative deepening is just terrible for real values. So when Russell and Norvig say, "Oh, it's the answer to everything," it's not really true. It's the answer to all the things where your the costs are all uniform, and there are no duplicates or very few. Nathan. That was correct. Okay. Um, can it be like inclusive by a constant amount? <gasps> like but 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 maybe maybe the entire rest of the state space fits in that next thing that you just did, right? So you but have to be a little clever about it. Like Take CS 931. <laughs> and if you if you can't wait until next spring, uh, ask me after class, and I'll point you to a paper. Okay. Ah. Uh, um, I think we already did that. Um, I already did that. Someone asked about the um, maximum speed of a computer, and this is totally outside my area of expertise. Um, so I'm not going to answer that. Um, you asked the ECE people, they know how to build computers, supposedly. Uh, is there an intelligence wall? Just like with processors now and, and, and circuits, there's a power wall. Like you can't increase the power or else the thing melts. So is there an intelligence wall? Well, if so, we're a long way from hitting it. <laughs> um, it's really a software question, really. I mean, we have so much computing power. I mean, if you look at Watson, right, it was like 3,000 cores or something or some very large number of cores and a terabyte of RAM or some huge gobs of RAM and uh, lots of disk. Um, Matt actually is working on Watson right now uh, when he's not being at TA, uh, so he knows all these statistics. Um, but it's like a big computer. So the question is not like, oh, we don't have enough computer power. It's that we don't know the right algorithms. Um, now, we know some cool algorithms, and that's what this class is about. But I feel like we're sort of like where physics was in the 19th century. Like we have some good theories, and like we can predict the sun's going to come up, and it's going to go down. and you know, the moon is going to be in this phase in this month, but like actually knowing that about gravitational lensing and stuff uh, and, and quarks and all that, like we have no clue about that for intelligence yet. Um, so we've still got a long way to go. So that's why it's a great field to be in. There are all these great unsolved questions. That's why I enjoy it at least. Okay, uh, that's, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, or do you go by something shorter? The uniform cost search. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Some people would quibble. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. I think we have the slides from the first lecture around here somewhere. Uh, oh, let's see if I can find them. Uh, first lecture. Oh, wait. No, it was the second lecture. Last time. Last time's slides. Um, so uniform cost search tests the goal at expansion time, like we're popping the node off the queue and we're just about to expand it, but we'd first we stop and we, we test if it's a goal. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this template is called best first search. And so uniform cost search is a best first search on G, the path cost. Um, with breadth first search, you can stop when you generate a node that's the goal. Because you know you've expanded all the nodes at the previous depth. So you can stop at generation time. And you may say to yourself, well, okay, fine. Let's talk about quibble. I mean, you know, we're just moving this thing down a just one, two, three lines of code. It's just the previous level. What's the big difference? R remember how the tree looks. Um, oh, why is that? There we go. Remember how trees look, right? So. If I can stop here, as opposed to going all the way down here and all the way over until I get this guy again, remember that there are twice as many, there are as many nodes in this level as there are in the entire rest of the tree put together. So half of the search time is in the last level. 
So if you can quit at generation rather than expansion, your search is now magically twice as fast, which so, some people care about speed ups of only a factor of two. Um, so that's a, a useful thing to know if you want to be a search guru. Um, great question. 